One in five suffer. Erase the stigma. Brain difference is not a crime. Mental health isn't just your problem. It's our problem. And now, Mental Health Mondays with Marla and Dave. Thank you. I want to take time out right now um, to speak to being a mental health advocate, advocating for those who have mental health challenges, for those who are suffering. Um, I'm, it's no secret that I'm super outspoken, but this is even harder because at this moment, we are in the process of trying to advocate for our son. Mental Health Monday, this show was born based on advocacy, based on conversations, based on connecting communities, connecting stories, connecting help. That's what we do. Let me tell you, as you're going to see with all of the new information, people, mothers and families are speaking out left and right. Mental health is not an easy thing. It's not neat. It's not a cute um, fairy tale or, or a, or a uh, issue or a disease or a, a challenge with who you are that is, that is easy. Mental health can be ugly. You hear what I'm telling you? It is hard. It is hurtful. It is stressful. And because of the lack of resources we have, it has become impossible to manage. Pretty much impossible. Getting the proper mental health help unless you are independently wealthy is like falling literally through the eye of a needle. It's that difficult. It's a wormhole. And so all we can do now is raise our voices to the mountaintops. All I can do is continue to advocate any place that I can. My voice, my story, my experience, my truth and my transparency is my truth and my transparency is something that is a tool that I hope will open up the minds and the pockets of the people who can make a difference. We need help. I'm a mother who's saying we need help, not just for me, but for all of us. Take a listen to the actual steps and some of the other mothers who are experiencing the very same stress and trauma. It's rough. I don't know what anybody wants from me. My son is mentally ill. Um, I've dealt with this for 15 years. My son broke out several windows in my home. As you can see, my windshield, um, side mirrors, everything. Patio door. And it's hard getting help. Yeah, um, A, comments like this would have um, devastated me and made me cry um, for days um, four years ago when we had to send him to his first residential treatment placement. It's traumatizing for everybody. And the way you're sending it here is that you think it's traumatizing for just him. So I'm going to assume you have no experience with having to deal with mental health in your immediate family. Same, I'm exhausted is an understatement. I'm going to briefly this is all the strength I have I, I, I don't have the energy to it's not even energy I think that at this point it's impossible for me to talk to my loved ones people who know me and love me and, because I won't make it um so they released DJ early from the mental hospital in LA, as they always do. And supposedly the social worker found a, a <laughs> live-in residential treatment place for him. And uh, try to keep it together. I, I, keep my thoughts together even because I haven't slept at all um, so they released him 
the treatment center agreed to house him. And to make the story that's long short, once they got him there, David spoke with, before he went, David spoke with the people who run the facility and explained what it was. It's a faith-based facility that's run by a church and what the requirements would be for DJ to be there, which he met. Agreed that that's where he was gonna go and I'll give everybody a timeline reminder for those who are keeping up with this for your own information when it comes to your loved ones and how mental health is handled. So DJ's incident of arrest was on Sunday, uh, the 5th, he was, the charges were dropped because there were no, the charges, it doesn't mean that, the, anyway, the charges were erroneous. They, the charges weren't going to be able to stand no matter what. They couldn't stand. Um, but I was still going to have to go through the process at that point when the holiday was over of getting DJ from out of an, a situation of jail and incarceration into a situation of mental health care and treatment that's a separate court in Los Angeles called court 95 and I couldn't do anything on Monday which it was early the wee hours of the morning that he was detained and taken in on Monday there was nothing I could do because it was a holiday that was Labor Day so on Tuesday I start working on that David was in Taiwan wasn't coming home until the 7th so on the 6th as you guys have seen on Instagram, as I was sitting in my home watching tennis, um, DJ just came bursting through the door. The charges had been dropped. We hadn't been notified. He came home. He was still completely in a psychosis. No treatment had been administered or given. And he walked in and informed me that he was calling the police on me, which is on live, and that he was gonna have me arrested which at that point I said, okay, that's great because all my goal was is to get him into, which is how this works, get him into uh, a mental health, uh, a 5150, get him into, a man, an, into an involuntary hold. The first one is a 5150, that's 72 hours. Once you're in that hole and you come closer to the, to the end of the term of 72 hours, which is meant for stabilization, two doctors, two psychiatrists have to weigh in essentially and examine you and have a conversation with you and they decide whether to release you at that point or to extend your hold. DJ's hold was extended to a 5250 which means 14 days. Okay? That all happened. His first 5150 was on the 7th. So 72 hours from that is 3 days and then they extended it for a 5250 which should be 14 days. Well, six days into his 5250, which was yesterday, they release him. Now, he found out yesterday that he was not going to be able to come home and that he was going to need to work with the social worker, as were we, to find him a place to go. That place was found. And when DJ got there and they, he, they asked him, and I'm not, I'm, secondhand information but I know this information came from Dave so I'm pretty sure it's accurate when they asked DJ basically what happened he mentioned throwing guns in the trash and whatever was happening and the so the the, the program decided that he was a gangbanger And that the head pastor um, was not present at the moment that DJ was brought there and they were disallowing him residency because that was their fear assessment, whatever it was. So David was on his way there to take DJ his belongings. When he got there, the person who runs the program, Dave walks through the door and immediately the, 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 the gentleman knew that 
that was a miss that was a wrong assessment of who DJ was and who we were by looking at Dave the minute he saw him he was like I, this is a mistake so his his staff who denied entry to DJ the pastor overrode it so at that point we're assuming that DJ is upstairs that or Dave was being going through intake so he called me I was on, I picked up the phone while Dave tried to work on what was happening as he was going to where DJ is and I picked up the phone and called the hospital and I wish God just says it wasn't so but I wish I could have recorded the conversation I had with the hospital I will give you some highlights I queried and asked why how is it that every single solitary time he is sick enough to be ordered onto a 5250 which is 14 days and every time you release him early how is that possible this is consistently happening how how and the lady on the phone says I said I, I said to her I realized that the mental health system is broken but this is ridiculous well ma'am you know the truth is that they really just it has everything to do with his insurance and what his benefits are and when his benefits will no longer pay for his hospitalization we let him go I said are you kidding me right now so what you're at, I want you to, I, I asked the lady this was a quote I said please say what you're saying out loud I want to hear you say it that you're telling me that my son and we are too broke to afford his mental health care which if my son again had cancer the whole world would be trying to assist so you're telling me that my son who by the way doesn't want to be homeless that is not DJ's desire sometimes when you're dealing with schizophrenia there's a freedom in that for them they don't want to be contained there's a lot of paranoia a lot of things go along with it that's not DJ's story he was trying to come home but we could not allow because of the fact that we're not treating him so we were scrambling to we're still scrambling we were and probably will continue with God's grace I don't have a good feeling about this but I'm gonna walk in complete faith and accept whatever answer I'm given at this point because I have no choice <laughs> I got no choice I'm all cried out um, I'm going to try our best to figure out what the cost is and I'm going to be rapidly trying my best to raise the money to put him into the right treatment facility which will have to be paid for direct uh, if we can find him so the clock is ticking when they went upstairs to find DJ he was gone they you know basically they had kicked him out then once Dave got there, they said, okay, we'll take him. Then once they, Dave left, they said, well, Dave said, can I speak to him? They were like, no, he's upstairs in intake. And then when Dave left, the pastor called Dave and said, your son's not here. He's gone. So they were all looking for him last night till about one o'clock in the morning, my time, or nine o'clock uh, LA time to no avail no they I, I don't know what the process of him signing out is but they're the ones who transported him to the facility that said that they would house and treat him it's a treatment center for men that have DJ's very condition um, except you know it, it's it's in the heart of LA uh, and so the clientele that they get is mostly minority and they did not want to have 
an issue beyond DJ's illness, which that's not who he is. But however, they understood how he came to be in this episode and show up at their doorstep, they interpret it as a problem. That could be a future problem for them. So everyone has failed him slash us, everybody. DJ is an example of, of a human being that has fallen through every crack for help. Dr. Phil show used him slash us um, did not follow through with the length of time that they promised help. Cause once he got on the meds, a program like creative care was exactly what he needed. But once he got on the meds and we took him back to creative care on their promise, he was there eight days and they were like, okay, he said something inappropriate to a resident. Come get him. They have mental health challenges. He didn't touch anybody. Nobody touched him. He wasn't, He's not a fighting kind of person um, until he's cornered or threatened or in, even if it's in his mind. Um, and I'm just, <laughs> I feel like that no one can see the humanness in all of this. It, it, it's, it's like making a decision that we're not going to lend help and healing to those who are hurting and suffering unless it's something that we think. A, maybe it's because you can't fix mental health the way you can fix other maladies and issues. I don't know. But what I do know is it's extraordinarily painful and it feels like that somebody has just decided that my son doesn't have it the world the, the system of health care decided mental health is not, so not a priority that that he along with others who want the help just don't matter and they're just literally thrown away like used paper towels you just you know ball them up and get a new role and this is my son this is our son David and I are broken and Dave does not express the same way that I do and that's okay I'm telling you that we are both broken period so I haven't been able to sleep. I got up. I'm walking back from my, where my father stays because I just have a lot to do and I have to create some energy some kind of way. And I think that in some ways this is actually how I challenge God because... evidence of his faith is the fact that I can stand up. Gina, you have to go back. I'm not going to repeat the whole story. But they told him he had acceptance into a facility once he got there. They felt like he was a, 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 a danger beyond his mental health issue um, based on how he ended up getting to that point and told him that they weren't going to admit him but David didn't find that out till he was he had gotten down to the facility to give DJ his belongings that he had asked for um, yeah, there's no rest uh, you know I feel helpless and I feel super small and insignificant 
and powerless is how I feel. And I feel like all my love and all my value was in my children. I mean, I poured what I didn't have into all of it. Many prayers to ask God to help me find more. Um, the pain is so great that I'm now just numb. I don't, I can't feel, you know, I find little sparks of joy, you know, and I have this to say to parents. As I'm taking this walk (laughs) today, I walk past and I walk back past it now. A junior high and elementary school all separate but in the same street and a preschool a daycare and in tears I have one more regret I wish that I had just um, really truly just cherished each one of those phases and moments and at the time just as a young mother you know you're doing everything you have to do and it feels like a lot I didn't realize how good I had it when they were young and I could just enjoy them. Look at there, I have more tears. Yeah, and that's the last thing. There's too many of us going through this for things to stay this way. We can't lose a generation of our black children to mental illness. (laughs) And it's shaping up to look like that's the next killer. It's wiping us out. More and more people are coming forward and talking about it. But it's not enough. We got to keep going. So, that's my update for today.